will do i will do i will do all of this is god's work and if it is god's work it's done if it is god's work done 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 say i have a new heart say clean water has been sprinkled on me i'm sanctified accepted purified justified perfected right now done done god is not going to he has he has given unto us all things that pertain to life is he going to give us or he has given us done 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 so any gospel that you hear any preacher telling you the lord will do it is another you you know i tell men of god stop giving christians false hope stop it it's fraud stop giving believers false hope making us look like other religions where we are not sure of what will happen we are waiting to see what god will do no with god done 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 we are not in a religion don't compare us with a religion we are in christ christianity is not a religion christianity is life leave that in but this man eh? but this man which man the meeting point of god and man is a man the meeting point of god and man is a man but this man after he had offered once is he going to offer he had done done okay after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for ever did what sat down on the right hand of god what does that mean done so is god going to why is god going to heal why is god going to bless why so if a preacher say give so that god can bless you what is that another the revelation i have and the revelation you have are two different things jesus is not going to heal you he healed you listen when i pray for you i'm simply awaking your flesh to the realization that jesus healed you on the cross that's what i'm doing there is no healing coming to you healing is already there the bible says he has blessed us with every heavenly blessing that con every spiritual blessing that consists to anything that we do here on earth or in heavenly places everything is sorted out he healed us see the difference that's why peter says by his stripes he were healed he looks in the past as for me don't talk to me about this because i was healed but you you just got to realizing it now pastor paul you know what god told me god told me you are so holy that the most holy lives inside you he said you are so holy that the most holy lives inside you yeah he lives in he said i will live in you i will walk in you you are my house your body is the temple of the holy ghost you are bought with a price therefore glorify god in your spirit and in your body which are god's so the most holy lives inside you stop letting people mentally abuse you and tell you who you are not and who you are look for yourself in christ and see who you truly are now when we say the word holiness it has been bastardized many people think holiness is sinlessness that's not correct 
so there's this ideology going on in the body of Christ which is actually a fallacy it's an ideology of sinless perfection now there is no such thing as sinless perfection there's only perfection in Christ there's no sinless perfection so you are made to be struggling okay i won't tell a lie again i won't tell a lie i won't do bad things so you're in a straight jacket you're trying you're trying then you ask yourself for how long will i continue like this for how long will i continue like this then you fall boom, you stand up oh i'm not sure we'll make heaven oh may we make heaven jesus heaven at last that mentality has messed you up but jesus said my yoke is easy my burden is light who am i talking to in this place paul speaking said jesus is made unto us righteousness holiness so holiness is not what you do holiness is a person jesus is holiness when he came on your inside you became holy what's the meaning of holiness set apart set apart and you are set apart he calls you royal priesthood holy nation peculiar people a chosen generation called out of where darkness into where his marvelous light so your salvation made you holy yeah. Ay, yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody say you don't know me i know you it's not that you don't know you let me give you a scripture hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 and i want everybody to read with me what did he call you who are you are you holy how holy are you are you holy how holy are you are you righteous how righteous are you as righteous as jesus as holy as jesus bone of his bones flesh of his flesh he cannot be sick i cannot be sick he cannot be poor i cannot be poor most people have a problem with the issue of holiness and righteousness those are two things you can't change yourself the bible tells us he has separated us from the people that's being holy it has nothing to do with your action. Righteousness has nothing to do with your action. It's a gift from God. So in churches, we are demanding things that we can't do ourselves as preachers. Holiness is not an act. If I separate you from the people, holiness, the word holy is not even a holy word. It's just a Greek word. If I take you right now and make him stand there by this act is holy i've just set him apart nobody is more righteous than the other one no one but the fruits of righteousness different you can increase in the fruits but you can't increase in righteousness there's nobody who is more righteous than the other one and i give this example i'm british on paper and he's british by birth same benefits when i put my passport forward this is not redder than mine. They are all red. Righteousness. Righteousness is a place in God. Amen. Nothing to do with what you have done and everything. So right now, don't think I need to do something for God to do something for me. No. No, 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 no. But one thing God demands is faith. Jesus offered his body which was destroyed in death. His spirit was separated. And he went to hell on the third day when he rose he rose as high priest in his physical death sacrificial goat spiritual separation goat of escape when he rose from the dead he rose as a high priest that is the import of redemption now in the old covenant they choose you from among the children of Aaron no physical disability or deformity your body is perfect you cannot be blind you cannot be deaf you cannot be lame high priest had to be spotless before you are made a priest today jesus takes everyone who believes with their imperfection he takes everyone who believes with their imperfection with their weaknesses with their mistakes then he begins to perfect them he receives you the way you are then he begins to perfect you he takes imperfect men unclean men and makes them priests 
then he begins to perfect them as the high priest there's no demand in the new testament to be made a priest the moment you're born again you're a priest but the moment you're born again jesus now begins to walk his his holiness in you he begins to walk it in you for it is he that walketh in you he begins to walk it in you he doesn't demand anything of you before he makes you a priest first peter 2 9 pay attention by a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness so he called you out of darkness and he made you a royal priest he called you out of darkness he made you a peculiar person he called you out of darkness he made you a holy nation it's not dependent on your conduct it's dependent on his work you are holy because of what he did you're not holy because of what you did he calls you royal priesthood holy nation glory to god why because you are as a result of his work when you want reconciliation you don't hold on to rights god wanted reconciliation with man so you know what god did god took the place of the offender god said okay you have done all the evil come out step aside bam you step there god say i step in your place i am the one he became sin he didn't just carry sin he became sin personified jesus and sin became one so that you and righteousness can become one glory to god i don't know if somebody's understanding what i'm teaching here it's called substitutionary sacrifice he's not imputing he's not accrediting sin on anybody why he wants reconciliation god decided to reconcile so god decided to assume the state of the offender and took the punishment and the moment you believe in what christ has done you are no more an offender you enter into his righteousness you become the righteousness of god by faith the righteousness of god how by faith faith where faith in christ you become his righteousness it's not an act it's not an attitude it's not a performance it's not a behavior and there are people that can't take it because religion has finished their brains it's not about performance it's faith in christ and let me tell you born again is not character modification born again is not renovation of the old man born again is not an improvement on the old man uh -uh. born again is a brand new life that comes into you that has his character and his charisma so now as you grow in the knowledge that life begins to find expression it's not a set of do's and don'ts it's not the things i used to do i do them no more the places i used to go i go there no more which is a lie it's a lie the places you used to go included your work the places you used to go included market and you're still going there is it not true which is a lie you still go to most of the places you used to go the fact that you don't go to some doesn't mean you're not going to others so christianity is not the things i used to do i don't do anymore christianity is a brand new life of god that requires you to grow in so that it can manifest maximally and swallow the totality of you that's what christianity is it's not trying to be a nice guy and then in the afternoon you behave nice in the night you behave like the devil that you are hypocrisy that's not christianity christianity is you accept who you are you accept who god has made you you walk like that while you're looking at the scriptures and as you're looking you are changing so there's no hypocrisy you're just yourself and when you change it is for real you're not a pretender i'm not communicating at all and the power of the word of god is able to bring that change as you keep looking that change comes and that change becomes permanent god didn't lay on jesus our conduct he laid on jesus our iniquity because in conduct our conduct differs what is common among all of us is iniquity which is the sin nature because some of us here you don't lie when it comes to lie you would rather die than lie but some of us here you lie without thinking okay but you cannot steal it's hungry in you you can't touch it 
in that area of conduct you have strength the other person does not lie but he can steal even with your eyes open he can steal something from your hand he has developed a level of skill so we all have different conducts true or false I say true or false. We all have different conduct. Some of you, if you see alcohol, your body cannot be normal. You must drink it and be stupid before you are happy. And some of us, when you see alcohol, you vomit. It doesn't attract you. Some of us here, you know, different conduct. All of us have different conducts. So our conducts differ. That is not our unifying point. However, sin nature is in all of us so what god laid on jesus was not our conduct was our sin nature he put on him the iniquity the sin nature that's why he became sin so we can become righteous by nature it is the nature of righteousness that eventually produces the conduct of righteousness just like the nature of sin produces the conduct of sin so what God changes is not the branches, it's the root. If the root is good, it's a matter of time. It will affect the fruit. Are we teaching here? If you're hearing me say, I hear you. So what happens to a man is that that nature called sin is changed. That man becomes righteous and begins to walk in righteousness. Somebody shouting very loud, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to say it one more time because Satan hates to hear it. So I want him to hear it like a hammer on his head. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now shout it very loud. I am righteous. Now stand on your feet and say louder. I am as righteous as Jesus. Listen, listen, listen. What you're saying is very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. So I want you to be serious and mean what you say. Satan can't stand that. That has been Satan's fight all of your lifetime to ensure that you never become righteous. And that is why Jesus died to make you righteous. Now you believe in Jesus, automatically you're righteous. Say it again one more time. I am as righteous as Jesus right now. Say it again right now. Say right now, I stand before God as righteous as Jesus. No record of sin on my account. Jesus bore my sins. I bear his righteousness. He bore my sin. I bear his righteousness. He did not manage my sin. He radically took my sin. I do not manage his righteousness. I radically enjoy righteousness. Now shall you one more time. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Go ahead and celebrate it this afternoon. My name I know God. Glory! 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 Amen. You need to understand Sri Lanka. Jesus wants you, your faith, not you believing for somebody. You can pray for them. But when they are of age, you can't believe for them. And make people, many people make that mistake, especially in these regions. I keep saying in these regions because Christianity is too young. And when Christianity is too young, we tend to use past truths that are not the present truth of Christ. Peter said, being, being loaded with this present truth, if there is present truth, there is past truth. We are children of his resurrection. Children of the covenant. Do you know how many Christians are doing covenants with God? A lot. Boy. It has never worked. It's a lie. Let me shock you a little bit. You cannot make a covenant with God. I know you. what you have done. God, I make a plan with you. God will be smiling like uh, you can't. The covenant God did with Jesus is enough. Jesus and you are covered inside that covenant. You cannot make another one. That's why the covenant you made with God has not succeeded yet. Yet you made a promise with him. You even knelt down and said, God, this, I will do this. God is like smiling like, mm -mm. Jesus has done it. All you need to accept is the covenant inside Jesus. That is How many people said, if, you, if I give God, if you allow me to do this, I will marry a Christian. Or, or if I do this, uh, I will marry this, I will do this, I will work for you. If you give me 1,000, if you give me $2,000, then God gave you 2,000. And you still haven't worked for him. In the New Testament, we don't have a covenant with God. 
Sometimes you hear people say, I'm a covenant child. I have a covenant with God. I know how hard I pray. If it is not for my prayer, and they brag about all that they do to ensure that God does, you're not a covenant partner with God. You're not a covenant child of God. You don't have a covenant with God. You are just a beneficiary of an existing covenant between God and God. God made the promise. God fulfilled the promise. You are a beneficiary of the promise. So there are no demands. No demands. There are no terms of covenant between man and God. No terms. God is not waiting for you to fulfill anything. He made the covenant. He fulfilled the covenant. So that means the promise of God to Abraham was not based on Abraham's performance. Because God made promise to Abraham that only God will fulfill. You know, in this business, it is all God to God. He makes the promise. He fulfills the promise. Man is just a beneficiary of the promise of God fulfilled by God in man's interest. But the law, uh, the law is a conditional promise that is dependent on man's performance. Dependent on man's performance. And nobody is able to keep the law. Because the law has a strict regulation. You break one, you break all. So since you can't meet the demands of the law, you become a victim of the law. The law is do this, do that, and you will be blessed. You draw nine, I draw nine. You don't draw nine, I don't draw nine. If you shall hearken and do, I will bless. If you shall not hearken and do, you will be cursed. That's the law of Moses. And there are pastors, that's the line of their preaching all the time. They put their people under bondage. They tell if you don't do this and this and that, you cannot be blessed. If you don't do this and this and that, you cannot be blessed. So they create a picture of a God as a contractor that needs mobilization before he does something. But my father is not a contractor. He does not depend on man to do what he wants to do. He does what he does because that is who he is. He does not wait for you to bless. He blesses you. You only wake up to realize that he has blessed you. You don't have to do something for God to do. In fact, God did before you woke up to realize you need to do anything. It's a self-fulfilling promise. And that is the covenant of God confirmed before in Christ. For we wrestle not. Wrestling has rules. Even in the Olympics, wrestling has rules. You can't kick, you can't bite. It says so that you can be able to withstand, not to fight. So you may be able to withstand against what? An evil day. So you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand. Wait there. Don't go anywhere. So after all this standing, what do we do? Fight thereof. Verse number 14. Oh, so we're still standing. Why are we standing? Because the devil is defeated. Now, battle is a war is between two undefeated enemies. Once one is defeated, it's no longer a war. It's somebody becoming a nuisance. Christ have delivered us from the cause of the law. Paul was asking the church, pray for me, that God, the Lord will deliver me from unreasonable and wicked men. There are spiritual warfare, aggressive prayer, Binding and losing, taking territorial uh, city. Um, uh, we said that Jesus had finished the work, but we saw that Paul the Apostle fought with the beast of Ephesus for door of the gospel to be open. Because of the gospel, they say Satan hindered me. So I saw Paul doing a lot of spiritual warfare uh, in the place of prayer. What kind of prayer is the New Testament expected to pray? In the Old yes. Testament, it was a prayer to gain God's approval. In the New Testament, we have God's approval in Christ. Already. In the Old Testament, it was a prayer to try to defeat Satan. In the New Testament, 
Satan is already a defeated foe under our feet. In the Old Testament, it was a prayer to see if God would do something. In the New Testament, God has done everything for us. So what prayers do we pray in the New Testament? Paul listed a number of prayers for us. First of all, he said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know the hope of your calling. Number two, that you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Number three, that you may know the exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working what of his mighty, mighty power which he wrought in Christ right. when he raised him from, from the dead. dead. If yes. you observe it, he didn't say that you may have, say that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. Dealing with epignopsis, coming yes. to a place of accurate understanding and of what you already have. That's the first premise for prayer in the New Testament. He observed, he prayed the same prayer for Philemon. He said, pray for Philemon that the communication of your faith may be effectual, that you may acknowledge. The word acknowledge there is the same word for knowing. So most of the New Testament prayers are prayers for the knowledge of what Christ has already done. That is why all of them are like prayers of thanksgiving. Now, you talked about where Paul said, I fought with the beast of Ephesus. When he used the word beast of Ephesus, he wasn't talking of literal beast. The beast of Ephesus there is a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. And what he was dealing with there was persecution. Persecution that came to him because of the gospel. People that tried to make things difficult for him because of the gospel. When he even said, pray for me that I be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. For all men have no faith. Have no faith. If you look at the pretext and the post-text, he's talking about persecution from people that do not believe the gospel. Persecution from people that don't love the gospel. Persecution from people that hate the gospel. So that deliverance is not deliverance from the devil. It's deliverance from human beings. Deliverance from people that will persecute you and attack the gospel. Then Brother Paul also prayed. He prayed that you will walk worthy of the Lord. And to all pleasing, being fruitful unto every good work. He prayed that you may be sincere and without offense. All of these are prayers that has to do with ministry. So that you will do the ministry with sincerity. You will do the ministry without offense. You will walk worthy of the Lord in the ministry. All of those are prayers for revelation knowledge and prayers for the ministry, the preaching of the gospel. Even what we call spiritual warfare, even though that word is not in the Bible, is an explanation. But what Brother Paul was teaching there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when he says the war, we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, had to do with evangelism, had to do with preaching the gospel. Because when you are preaching the gospel, you are in a warfare. You are pulling down mindsets. You are pulling down belief systems. You are pulling down you know, theories of men, opinions. You are casting them down so you can establish the knowledge of Christ in the heart of the listeners. So most of the New Testament prayers are prayers to know what is already yours in Christ Jesus so you can walk in its reality. Yes, Ephesians 6, 18. Pray in the Spirit always with all kinds of prayers and yes. supplication. All yes. kinds of prayers. Another translation says all manner. So the prayers. active word there, the active word in that verse is in the spirit. The active word in that verse is in the spirit. In the spirit. That yes. means all prayers should be prayed in tongues. In tongues, you are praying all prayers. Some of them your mind can't handle, but the spirit of God through you is channeling the prayers to the right places where the prayers are needed. So that's why Brother Paul will say, I pray in tongues more than all of you put together. Because the believer ought to pray more in tongues than in English all the time. Brother Paul will say, I will pray in the spirit and I will pray with my understanding. My understanding. Because praying in the spirit makes my understanding unfruitful because I'm praying in tongues. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, yes. ruler yes. darkness of this world, spiritual so the, weakness. So there's a wrestling somewhere. Explain to so us, please. The, that, that word wrestle there is not wrestling like WWF. That word wrestle there is enforcing. Yes. 
enforcing what is already yours. You are not trying to get it, you have already got it. It's to enforce. Then he now says, Well, he's not falling trousers or pouring kerosene and nicotine. You know, what is the machine gun prayer? Exactly. What is the living there is enforcing the victory that is already yours in Christ. Remember, 2000 years ago, Jesus Paul principalities and power and, powers. and made a public show of them. So when he says you are wrestling against principalities and power, what he's simply saying is that the things that will engage you are things that has been defeated. So what do mm. you do? You enforce the victory that is already yours. That's why Satan, I mean Paul will say, your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Then he now said, whom you must resist steadfast in the faith mm. that is in the faith stay in the faith maintain mm. your place in the faith in what christ has done and refuse mm. to change your confession stay there i have defeated the devil i am in victory i am what the word says mm. i am even when circumstances are contrary you stay and keep maintaining what christ has already done on your behalf so that is what we call warfare it's not warfare. a fight it's an enforcement of your realities in christ that in take up the whole armor of Christ, of God, where you may be able to resist to stand the evil, the, the, the wells of the devil, yes. haven't done all yes. to stand. Any more explanation? Yes. That? yes sir. What he's saying is, he's not saying you should wear the armor. As yes. a believer, you already have the armor now. You have the breastplate of righteousness because you are the righteousness of God. You have the helmet of salvation because you are already saved. You have the belt of truth because you have Jesus in you. You have your shoes of peace because you have Christ who is the Prince of Peace. You have your shield of faith because you have Jesus the author and the finisher of faith. You have the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God because you have Jesus the Word of God. So you already have Jesus in you. Now when he says you should put on, what he's simply saying is acknowledge, recognize that you already have these things. It is recognizing them that gives you a stand in the evil day. When you know that you're already fully dressed, what Christ has done is complete. You do not fight for victory. You fight from victory. Victory. You function victory. from a place of trial. Yes. Thank you, sir. I'm by no means saying demons are not real. I'm not saying deliverance is not necessary. Deliverance is necessary for the ignorant people that have demons. But what's wrong is for the minister to talk about deliverance continuously without teaching people why? Why is it that? Why is it that no demon has ever manifested in from me? In me? You? Never. We never saw it. Why? Why is it that generals of God, we never see videos of them wriggling on the floor, talking, I am here, I was here 24 hours ago. Why? How come the people that deliver other people are still not having videos out there that we can see of them being delivered? If they cannot be possessed, why are they not telling people the way not to be possessed? Because one thing ministers know is this. If they deliver you and tell you the secret for self-deliverance, you will not attend church. That's why deliverance session ministers will tell you come to church for 12 weeks. If you miss one deliverance session, we start over. That's you attending, that's offering, that's tithing, that's seeds. I'm a deliverance minister. I deliver the word. Oh, yes. The understanding that the devil is so empty. I looked at this woman and said, out in the name of Jesus. And the lady fell backwards. And listen, with her mouth closed, the groaning was coming out of the, from the stomach. Said it the second time she floated in the air like this. Left it. One lady was lying flat with the hands like this and flipped to the other side floating and went down with uh, tattoos and the tattoos disappeared to think how did she spin from there lying like a log not holding anything slowly dead I'm not saying rare you lift and you turn and you go down so amazing how the Bible says and there was a person possessed by demons and they brought the person to Jesus how come they managed to bring 
that person to Jesus. And nobody, nobody was beaten among the people that were bringing the person to Jesus. Because the devil has no power. He himself understands he has no power. All he does is keep pounding, keep suggesting stuff until you agree. We are born from the dead to life. We were dead in sins. The gospel came. We believe and the power that raised Christ from the dead raised us from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's what it means to be born again. Raised from death to life. So born again is not just a cliche for Christians. Born again is the reality that happens to a man who received the gospel. He is raised from spiritual death to life. The same word of faith that we preach is the same word of faith that Jesus spoke and rose from the dead. The same word of faith. So you must have faith in the gospel that when you preach it, it will take a sinner from a sinner to a saint. You must believe in the word of the gospel that when we preach it, it will take anyone condemned by sin and hell to become a son of God. Jatolaba. Look at the power of God. Look at what the power of God does. A celebrated prostitute whose body has been battered by prostitution give her the gospel the gospel rejuvenates her transfers her from darkness to light and now she stands like a woman that has never slept with any man since she was born she stands before God as pure as Jesus that's the power of the gospel it takes a man whose body has been battered by drugs battered by cocaine battered by heroin battered by drugs his body is spoiled. You look at him, you don't want to have anything to do with him. Yet, when the gospel is pumped into him, it takes him from a battered soul and puts him together as a brand new man that never existed before. It brings out a new creation out of rubbles. It brings out a new man out of an, an abandoned, forsaken, hopeless, helpless, useless person. The gospel makes him useful to himself, to God to humanity that's the power of his resurrection the gospel does not have power the gospel is the power so preaching the gospel is preaching what power jesus aligned with those words and said it and those words came forth with power if those words brought him into the womb of mary those words made him grow. Those words got him anointed. Those words made him overcome every temptation. Those words resisted the devil. Those words got him on the cross. Those words got him out of hell. Those words had been spoken. That's how we too are raised from the dead by the Spirit of God. He came out by himself. That's why you and I today, we get saved by the same word of truth. It is preached, you believe it, you confess it by yourself and you come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Satan can do nothing about a man. Nothing whatsoever. Come, come, come. Let me use it for illustration. Come and stand here. Let's say this man is in the kingdom of darkness and Satan has him bound. Satan has him chained. Satan has him tied down. He's a servant of Satan. Satan lives inside him. Satan lives inside him. Satan has built his throne inside him. Satan occupies him and he's surrounded by demons who will not allow him to walk away free. He has become Satan's headquarters. Satan has possessed him. Spirit, soul and body. You come with the word of faith. You come with the power of the gospel and you begin to speak and he listens and you speak and he understands. The moment he understands you don't need to be helping him. The moment he understands what you say, in his heart he believes it. By himself he opens his mouth. Jesus is Lord. When he says that, everything satanic collapses. It's totally, Satan is flushed out. And a brand new man emerges out of the rubbles. A man that never existed before. And at that same instance, he can turn and tell Satan, Hey, come here. Bow down now. Out. Satan will obey the same person. That's it. He doesn't need to go to spiritual authority training the moment he becomes a brand new man he is a master over satan instanta instanta he can commandeer the demons and all the devils of hell out of this entire environment and they will obey that's
that's what the power of salvation does when people say that after you're born again you can still go for deliverance they don't know what it means they don't know it they don't know born again do they know it how can they know it and be talking like that do they know what it means to be born again in fact some of them are not born again they are just rebranded if you know what born again is you won't say a man that is born again should go for deliverance what is deliverance deliverance is that satan packed sin satan demons they packed out jesus came in the heavenly jerusalem you become you become zion you become the temple of the holy ghost you are bought with a price your body your soul and your spirit are paid for and jesus has entered and taken residence light is all over your whole body is a ball of light they now say the man should go for deliverance from what from christ they don't know what born again is how can a man know what born again is and be talking so gibberish from demons you've been delivered satan has no rule over you anymore you are free from evil spirits you are now their master